quick background that's uh, usually is helpful. Um, I grew up on a farm uh, homestead in central Massachusetts, a town called Barry. Uh, my parents bought a 30 acres of 10 acres of field and 20 acres of rock and forest and swamp um, when I was four. Built a, a passive solar, um, you know, with a root cellar, a wood stove with hot water and cooking and heat. Um, and how long ago was that? Homestead, eight, 1981, 1881. Um, and uh, so I grew up on a homestead. Um, we, you know, did pasture poultry, um, you know, grass fed hogs. We did, uh, you know, we had our own milk cow, uh, chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, fruit trees, berries. Um, we were, you know, started a farmer's market in the center of town in the 80s. I think we were certified organic in 86, CSA in 91. Um, so I uh, feel somebody here just said, I thought you'd be older. I'm like, well, <laughs> I started young. <laughs> um, uh, my parents, uh, were, I like to say, weren't good enough farmers to um, make a living farming. And so they have a day job, which was running NOFA, uh, Massachusetts. So we've been heard of NOFA, the summer conference, um, the natural farmer. Uh, basically, they were, um, my father's the other natural farmer. My mother ran the summer conference for 25 years. So I've got a, a background as a farmer, homesteader. In the nonprofit world, um, um, I don't have time. Uh, <laughs> when I got married uh, 10, 12 years ago, I was I had no other viable skill sets besides farming. I hadn't developed a career, as it were. Um, I was managing my parents' farm, and um, we were making. I mean, I was <laughs> still weren't making any money, and I was like, oh, I got to actually provide for some other people. I have to figure out how to make a living. Um, and so the process of trying to understand how to Make a living farming has, um, you know, evolved into a, a really interesting um, life at this point. Uh, right now, my wife and I have a 24-acre farm in North Brookfield, which is two towns south of where I grew up, um, but an old, rundown uh, New England dairy, um, you know, white house, red barn, um, 15 acres with a house in the barn uh, for 115,000. Um, the house was a house was a tear-down. Barn was condemned. You don't. <laughs> you know small towns, like barns don't get condemned. condemned. This is officially a condemned barn. Um, anyway, we salvaged the place, um, and we, um, at this point, have, we do about two and a half acres of vegetables. A half of an acre of that is hoop houses. We've got eight different hoop houses we do. Um, a lot of salad greens. I sell fresh greens 11 months of the year, one layer of plastic. Uh, we do pasture poultry, grass-fed beef. Um, sell mostly to restaurants and um, in Cambridge, Boston. It's an hour. Hour and five into Harvard Square and back is, you know, I leave at 5 a.m. home by 7.30, leave my thousand bucks for the week, I'm done. Um, so basically I figured out a way to make a living farming and so that now I have free time to go around the country and blow my mouth off, um, which is the nonprofit side. I got involved in an organization called Remineralize the Earth in 2004, 2005, 2005, 2006, when I was struggling with trying to figure out how to be a better farmer. Um, and... Um, came across a bunch of information that I had not been privy to growing up in the organic movement about how life works, basically. And so that's been my effort, is to understand how to do a better job growing healthier plants so I can um, make a better living farming, uh, raise healthier children. Uh, but I also think it's a, it's a radical act, growing healthy plants. Um, I think we can systemically address a number of really deep and transient um, cultural political, economic, environmental, social, spiritual issues through growing healthy plants. So all my radical activism can be sort of couched in this in this endeavor of talking about how to make a living farming, how to grow healthy plants, etc. Um, so that'll be the basic agenda. Um, the organization, the Biology Food Association, is a, got a couple questions about that. Um, we are a 501c3 uh, nonprofit educational organization. I think we're six years old. Um, uh, it's basically, it's been building out of a process of me going around and giving workshops, courses for growers on how to grow healthy plants. I call it Principles of Biological Systems. Um, and at this point, we do two-day courses all over the country. Um, we've got chapters in 12 or 15 states, depending on how you consider level of actual engagement. Um, we do a two-day course, and that's what um, she was referring to at the beginning, is there's going to be one here later this fall. I'm not sure the dates exactly. but. Um, um, 
yeah, our overt objective is increasing quality in the food supply. We suggest that um, at the center of a lot of the sustainable ag um, movements and conversation is, you know, from a rudimentary standpoint, healthy food, nutritious food, flavorful food, aromatic food, food that can heal. Um, that's what organic people are talking about. That's what local people are talking about. That's what permaculturalists are talking about. That's what biodynamic people are talking about. Um, you know, there's some high ground here where we can all coordinate. And so um, not be in our separate streams is the idea about what, let's take best practices from permaculture, best practices from biodynamics, best practices from organic, my PM. You know, there's all kinds of wisdom. And um, let's let the quality of the food be the standard. Let's not um, get worked up about labels and names and catchwords and you know, all that fattest baloney. Let's actually let our tongues and our um, noses and the way it affects our bodies be the real be the real standard. Um, so we coined this term bionutrient to refer to those compounds in crops which correlate with flavor and aroma, which correlate with health-giving attributes, which correlate with well-functioning soil systems, et cetera, et cetera, um, with the idea that at some point there will be a um, ability to test or monitor levels of bionutrients in crops. So what are the levels of those flavorful aromatic compounds? If anybody's ever experienced viscerally um, a store-bought tomato um, versus a homegrown tomato, they know the difference, you know, physiologically, instinctually, and yet we have no conversation about that much, and that's really what matters as far as we're concerned. Um, and you can go into biochemistry, and you can go into, you know, all kinds of really interesting microbiome stuff. And go down! <laughs> hey, how's it going, Lionel? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and so, you know, as, as part of our endeavor, our sort of, our, 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 our grand vision is to give consumers the ability to actually test quality of point of purchase. So most people, unfortunately, buy food. Um, they spend money buying food generally. Um, and that's your your vote, I would suggest, in this day and age, this culture is your money. Um, so if we can support people who buy food in purchasing food that is most flavorful and aromatic, um, that is most nutritious for their children, will most well help them in preventing and curing disease, um, then we have a high ground around which the whole food movement, which I think is this massive, amazing social movement potential, can coordinate, organize. It's not just the growers, it's the nutritionists and the consumers and the mothers groups and the, I would suggest the environmental activists. Uh, we can go broadly into all that, but I'm not giving you any practical information. So in rough, broad strokes, that's the organization. You can talk more later if you'd like. And like I said, there's propaganda in the back. Um, the, we do have our annual conference happening in the beginning of December at Tripoli, which is a retreat center in Western Mass on the 5th and 6th. We've got a, quite a lineup um, there of speakers and topic areas. Um, so, basics, principles of biological systems. I'm running out of time. I don't have um, I'd like to start with a um, big figure, which probably can't be seen. Can anybody see that? Love it. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Front row can. I'm going to use this color to look at this a better contrast, even though it's going to um, So, I'm going to call this a stick figure plant for those who can't quite discern what it is I'm doing scribbling here on the board. Um, we've got roots down here, we got stems up here. I'll put a couple leaves on just for fun. Um, this is conceptual. The idea here is that most plants are green. Um, if you looked around, you've noticed most plants are green. Um, we understand most plants are green because they're full of um, chloroplasts. It's the sort of organelle that has um, that manufactures um, sugar and oxygen from carbon dioxide and um, water and sunlight. So it's CO2 plus H2O plus sunlight equals oxygen and sugar. Everybody learned that probably in ninth grade or something around, you've heard about this. Um, so all the green leaves are there basically to facilitate this chemical reaction. Um, and what's interesting is that what plants do with the byproducts um, is apparently, um, well, it, it basically is the entree of the conversation. So oxygen we know is emitted out through the uh, stomata into the atmosphere and we breathe it. Um, sugar, which is the other main uh, you know, byproduct is in majority in healthy plants, so we can say 50% plus of the sugar that's manufactured in the leaves is literally taken by the plant, dropped down through the stem, through the root, and injected into the soil. So plants are covered themselves in these 
um, in this greenness to make things that, that it then emits into the atmosphere. So what the hell's going on? Um, what's the deal here? Um, this is, I think, I mean, foundational to my understanding about, about priorities, simple best practices, etc. Um, what we understand is that in nature, nobody adds fertilizer. Have you heard of that one? Yeah? No composting, no cover cropping, no um, manuring, no fertilizing, no 10-10-10, etc. Nature has evolved a capacity for plants to get all their fertilizing done in situ. And the primary mode by which they do that is through a symbiotic relationship with um, people. I like to call them people, bacteria, fungi, etc. Um, what happens is the plant does not have the capacity to digest its food. The plant can't digest the soil to solubilize calcium or copper. The plant can't digest the atmosphere to harvest nitrogen, etc. The plant can't do that. Um, the people the plant feeds do that. The bacteria and fungi that are the symbiotic, um, you know, I like to call it digestive system uh, of the plant, are the ones that, and so basically there's a relationship, with this, it's, a, it's a virtuous circle, where the more the plant grows, the more leaves it makes, the more sugar it makes, the more it feeds the soil life, the more the soil life can go and access the nutrients the plant needs, etc. So when I'm talking about growing plants, I really don't care a hell of a lot about whether it's, you know, apple trees or um, tomatoes or cucumbers or echinacea or, um, you know, clover. Um, as I understand it, the foundations of the whole process are the vitality of the bottom of the food chain, the life in the soil, and the leaf surface, of course. There's a whole other conversation about the leaf surface, but it's basically the same thing. Um, uh, the plant only does as well as its gut flora does. The middle of the food chain only does as well as the bottom of the food chain does. Um, people have heard about the uh, Grand Banks perhaps Grand Banks somewhere that's over there. Um, the fishing with, yeah. There's a spot in the middle of the ocean where all the fishermen go, you know, from New Jersey to Newfoundland, they all drive their boats out and they park at the same spot to go fishing. Heard about it? It's a little about Why do all the fishermen from New Jersey to Newfoundland go drive their boats out the same are. spot to park to go fishing? Because that's where the fish are. And that's why the fish there, because the fish food is there. Right? At the bottom of the food chain, we have the phytoplankton, which is feeds everything else. And the phytoplankton are at present at high levels only in certain environments where they have the critical ingredients of warmth and sunlight and nutrition, etc. Only where the bottom of the food chain can flourish can the top of the food chain flourish. Only where the bottom of the food chain can flourishes can the top of the food chain flourish. So what's most important is creating an environment for the bottom of the food chain to flourish. And if you don't have that environment, you may have this disease or that insect or that pest or whatever and it's like treating the symptom, not treating the cause. Well, you know about that with, with conventional medicine, right? Treating the symptom, not treating the cause. From a foundational standpoint, it's the health of the gut of the plant that determines the health of the plant. And we should really be worrying about what the gut of, what the, gut of the plant needs. Um, Ayurveda, people heard about Ayurveda, mm -hmm. the ancient Indian you know, science of, of healing has everything to do with the gut, right? It's all about the gut. Um, I like to say, when you were born, how many people were living between your mouth and your rear end? How many? Between your mouth and your rear end? None. When you're born, there's nobody in there. We know that we can't digest our food. We know that we are physiologically incapable of digesting our food. When we're born, one of the most critical steps necessary for our survival is inoculating us, establishing our gut flora. The passage of the birth canal inoculates our skin and colostrum, which is that which comes out of the breast before milk, after birth, is what inoculates our internal skin, our, our elementary canal. And um, when you're a, you know, when you're a colicky baby, colicky babies either got antibiotics or didn't get colostrum or whatever, they can't digest their food. It's like a colicky cow. Anybody heard of colicky cow? Right? 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 This is really, sh sh you know, <laughs> shrill pitch to it. Right? After a few days, that colicky cow will be dead because it can't digest its food. It needs its gut flora to digest its food. It's exactly the same with plants. We say that animals have internal digestive tracts and plants have external digestive tracts. But basically, we can say that the bacteria and fungi have evolved us to facilitate their um, expansion. Um, from a technical standpoint, I think actually that's a really interesting conversation. Um, at any rate, 
we understand that there's a critical symbiosis when it comes to growing plants. And so that's the, those are the management practices we want to, we want to be working on. So um, there's uh, five general topic areas of things that I think are necessary to um, be attentive to. Um, uh, air, water, carbon, which is, you know, or food, uh, minerals, and life. So when it comes to growing healthy plants, you want to make sure that you have, the, you know, sufficient spectrum of life, um, sufficient spectrum of minerals, uh, enough food, enough air, and enough water. If you're raising a ch child or a, a cat or anything, these same principles would apply. So when it comes to going out and being present in your field and trying to discern what needs to be done next, these are the things to be attentive to, I think, from a foundational standpoint. We can talk about of the subtler energetic aspects, which I get very excited about, but um, if you don't have any water to drink, the subtler energetic aspects are, you know, um, somewhat a bit the cart before the horse. So, um, just to speak, you know, fairly rapidly and have less of a of a back and forth like I uh, usually like to have because we don't have enough time for it. Um, life uh, is is probably the easiest thing to do. Um, if you you know take home one thing I'm going to do next year, that's going to be taking very little amounts of time and very little money and have a significant beneficial effect, the lowest hanging fruit, it's inoculation, as far as I'm concerned. Um, making sure that your plants are have a good, healthy gut flora established at birth. Making sure they get their colostrum. Um, it's extraordinarily simple. Um, depending on what, what you're starting your seeds in or seedlings, um, you know, the conventional process is this, uh, what they call sterile media. Have you heard of sterile media? comes in a bag, they call it potting soil, it's just sterile media, like we're proud that there's no life in here. <laughs> um, anybody who thinks that is someone you should be not feeding your children with, right? Um, yeah, that, 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 that is, a, is a, you know, this is a fear of life paradigm, which is, you know, But there are people rampant. That, that produce starting medium that is not sterile, you know, like right. the Moodoo people, for example. Well, so I'm going to go into suggestions of what you should have, and I'm hoping many people are producing their own or, or sourcing it more locally, but the conventional mindset is that you that the sterile media, which is basically inert um, structure with salt fertilizer, you know, which is basically like an IV drip directly into the bloodstream, um, totally short circuits the digestive system and, you know, starts you off with crack babies. I mean, your, your children, your, 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 you know, inoculated children, they're basically on an IV drip, they're on um, Gatorade, right? They're, the digestive system is short-circuited. When the, when the soluble nutrients are sucked up by the plant roots directly by the water roots, that's like drinking Gatorade. That's, you're not, you know, the digestive system is not being established. And so when you transplant those seedlings into the soil, um, you know, they don't have the critical vitality to, to establish well. So, so, I mean, I don't want to go into too much detail, we don't have time for it, but the basic concept is there. Um, what I personally use is inoculant, which is something you can purchase. It's also extraordinary, extraordinarily easy to go and make your own inoculant from the, you know, ecosystem. Very, very simple. Um, uh, IMO, if anybody's never heard of the term uh, IMO, indigenous microorganisms, IMO, it's extraordinarily, you know, easy. You literally go for a walk with a bag or a bucket, bring your dog, bring your partner, with a child, go by yourself, doesn't really matter. And you want to look for plants that have shiny leaves um, in as many microclimates as possible. Um, what do they say about um, what happens to organisms that get too much to eat? You know about this? What happens if you eat too much? Look, you grow fast. You get yeah, well, much nitrogen. <laughs> as, well, I was going to talk about humans for starters. Oh. Anybody have this experience? Eating too much? Yeah, Never. You know what happens to you? You do that for long enough? Gain weight. Yeah, it's, we get fat. It's the looking for the real simple answer. Get fat, right? So when you have too much to eat, you get fat. You know what happens to plants when they have too much to eat? They get fat. You know how you tell a plant that's fat and happy? Shiny leaves. It's got shiny leaves, right? We stockpile our extra energy living with fat. Plants do as well. Um, it's called the waxy cuticle. The thicker the waxy cuticle, the more wax the plant has stockpiled, the more energy reserve it has, the healthier it is. We can assume the more um, functional its gut flora is. So if you go for a walk through, you know, fields and meadows and forests and streams and, you know, all kinds of different microclimates, and you find plants that have shiny leaves and you dig up a handful of soil from underneath them and you put it in a bucket, 
you're basically harvesting a broad spectrum of microbiology, of well-functioning microbiology from the ecosystem um, to establish, help establish good gut flora. You can put it in the transplant hole, you can you know, cover it with water and, and water, you know, with a watering can, all kinds of interesting things you can do. Or you can purchase inoculant. Um, you know, I don't really care what you do, but understanding that um, getting your colostrum to your seeds is really a really powerful thing to do. Um, so that's one piece. Um, oxygen, I'll just go from the top down. Um, aeration is, of course, uh, critical. We know about the importance of air for life to breathe. Um, a majority of the people who live in the soil that feed our plants are aerobes. Um, so I like to say as far as you can reach your hand down into the soil somewhat readily is about as far as you should expect there to be sufficient aeration for your, uh, for your soil life. So, um, you know, you like start to get soil really deep underneath your fingernails an inch and a half down or three inches down because if you do, there's probably not enough air down there and that's probably going to be a systemic um, shortcoming for your, for your system. So, um, you know, I like to think of earthworms as a wonderful um, sort of report card, you know, looking at the level of, of night crawlers at night, um, you know, go out with a flashlight and see. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are able to drill through uh, plow pans. They, can, they do really remarkable things. Um, you know, that's a natural way to have it happen. I know they're not endemic, um, but um, depending on, on how your soil has been treated, um, you know, keeping your soil covered, I think, is a foundational piece of good management practices for keeping your soil loose. Anybody ever had a, a part of the garden where the soil was bare over the winter in a part of the garden where there was a pile of leaves or an old bale of hay over the winter, and you come out in April or whenever the snow melts up here, I'm not sure. It melts in April, usually. Usually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're usually safe by April 1st, but I'm, you know, <laughs> 70 miles south of here, and I think lower elevation. Um, that garden where the soil was bare, you know, is hard. You can't fit your fingers into it. That garden where the soil was covered is generally loose and probably covered with earthworm castings, is my experience. Mm -hmm. Depending on what you're growing, that's what you're looking for. You're looking to go out with bare feet and to feel the soil, you know, go down under your feet, not be not be hard. Um, so I like to say, where in nature do you see bare soil? Um, which have been clear cut, right? I mean, where sorry, where in where is nature? Yeah. Where is where nature where nature do you see bare soil? Not often. Beach. Desert, beach, right? If the, if the, if there's a you know anything happens, one of the things that nature seems to like to do the best of her ability is keep herself covered. Um, I suggest that uh, in the winter time. Well, this maybe sort of goes into the food the food piece, and it, it you know sort of is synergistic with the with the air piece um, and keeping soil covered. What happens is that you know the green leaves fall off in the winter, um, and so the plant is no longer feeding the soil life in the winter. And so what the soil life, you know, does is get stuff that's in the root cellar or it's been dehydrated or canned, um, and that's dead organic matter. So if you don't have anything on the soil for them to eat, then over winter they starve to death. And when you keep your soil covered over the winter, that's when the soil is loose and alive is because there's been food for them over winter. They've had a reserve uh, to put by for the winter. So cover crops, of course, are better than mulch. Um, you know, green is better than brown, but keeping the soil covered is what is critical and foundational, um, I think, for overall system function. So really rudimentary. Um, I like to aim for two weeks of the year that I can see my soil where I'm producing crops. Um, you know, maybe sometime when I'm putting the, putting the crops in or, you know, um, transplanting or pre preparing the beds and things like that. Maybe, maybe there's a couple of weeks in the year when I can see the soil, but in general, I aim to have myself covered as much as possible, either through cover crops or mulch or some combination. This is a perfect time of year to be under sowing cover crops. Um, um, you know, the general theme on cover crops has been that you want to, you know, what people do is they pull the tomatoes out or pull the whatever out, and then, and then they broadcast the cover crops and then they till the soil um, to, to get them in. Um, I suggest you wait for a tropical storm or a couple of days of thunderstorms and you broadcast your cover crop seed right in and underneath your tomato plants, your chard, your kale, your peppers, eggplants, whatever you've got growing right now, pretty much, maybe not salad greens, maybe not root crops, depending, um, but just about everything else. Um, if you broadcast your cover crops now, um, they're going to be tall enough when the frost comes to kill your tomatoes and kill your squash. Um, they, they, won't have, they won't have competed with them for sunlight, but they'll be established and you'll get a much better stand, which will be more food for soil life. But into my the tomatoes fall. are all mulched with newspaper and hay. I, yeah, so, so I have to pull that off to put down. Well, if you had enough moisture in the soil, depending on how much, 
how much um, mulch you put down. Uh, what I aim for is to have my mulch gone by this time of year, or pretty close to gone, um, because soil life has eaten it. So that means like four to six inches of hay. I use mulch hay because I can get it for really inexpensive. Me too. Um, so, you know, and generally there's some duff left, um, but broadcasting it and then you can sort of scuff it through or whatever. But what you want to do is wait for a couple of days of rain and broadcast them ahead of that, and they'll end up germinating in that in that mulch and reach down and, and generally be generally established fairly well. So. Uh, keeping the soil covered, keeping the soil alive as much as possible, I think, is a really, really rudimentary, really important, really foundational piece of the puzzle. What's your best cover crop? Um, um, I suggest that the mix is the best, that the, the cocktail is the best, that the broader spectrum of species is the best. Um, yet the idea of monocultures is another one of those fraudulent concepts of agriculture, which permaculture has called out. Um, you know, basically, if you think that a chicken has a gut flora and a cow has a gut flora and, a, you know, um, a rabbit has a gut flora, well, a cucumber has a gut flora, and a tomato has a gut flora, and an iron and an and a, and a, um, onion has a, has a gut flora. Um, but those, that's still monocultures if you got one bed of onions here, one bed of tomatoes there. When you put down multiple species of cover crops, you know, oats with uh, field peas, with forage radishes, you've got three different families of plants with, with a much broader spectrum of species in the soil, which is really foundational. It's about the, the vitality of the life in the soil. And anything you can do to get a polyculture into your system as much as possible, the more you can, the better. The more perennials you can, the better, depending on the size of your system and what you're doing. And are people selling a mix, or do you have to mix your own? Uh, look up cocktail cover crops. You'll be overwhelmed with the spectrum of species, spectrum of products. It's really, I mean, the NRCS is coming out strong behind this in the past couple of years, which is amazing. Anybody who's but in our local agway, are we going to find a mix, or are we going to I don't know. Them? If you okay. don't, start hassling them. Right. This I have is, some, I'm from NRCS, I do have yeah. some cover crop um, fact sheets up at our booth up There's there. tons of information about uh, out there about this. And this is, I mean, the science is pretty much categorical, um, that the broader the spectrum of species, you know, people in North Dakota are basically giving their fertilizer budgets down to zero through a, an amazing cocktail cover crop mix. They're basically harvesting, making available for their crops all the nitrogen, all the potassium, all the phosphorus needed for next year's crop. Um, um, this is this is polyculture. This is permaculture applied, um, you know, mixed with with annual annual cropping. So, um, yeah, that's um, enough on that. Potentially, any specific questions? Just a quick question. When you said it would kill the tomato plants, then they just stay there. You don't have to pull them out or anything. We can talk about disease and pests, or the concept of pulling things out in the first place. Mm -hmm. I mean, oftentimes the rationale is that you're afraid of diseases and pests, oh, okay. um, uh, which is the rationale behind rotation ro rotating your crops. Okay. Um, um, and, you know, somebody who grew up on an organic farm has been doing this for 30 years plus now. Um, we rotated uh, every year our potatoes, you know, across the street a couple thousand feet away. And the potatoes would be an inch and a half tall. And all the potato bugs would have found them. Anybody have this experience? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, how the hell did they figure it out? Minor, minor, minor tangent. What are those things called on top of their head? What are they called? Radar. <laughs> no, what are, they, what are they called? Antenna. Antenna. You know what they actually are? Snippers. They're actually antenna. <laughs> They're actually antenna. If you've got a potato leaf, well, let me talk about biochemistry here. Jumping into biochemistry to explain yeah. entomology yes. on the way to talking about cover crops. Um, so the plant exudes these sugars into the soil and um, you know feeds the soil life. It basically says there's different pieces of soil life and the, and the some are good at solubilizing copper, some are good at solubilizing, you know, calcium, some are good at, you know, tying up um, arsenic or digesting dioxin or, or whatever. My general answer to anybody who's got questions about uh, toxins in the soil is that the more well-functioning the soil life is, the less you have to worry. Um, and the best way to digest, um, you know, toxic compounds that are manufactured or to sequester um, heavy metals is through the functionality of the biological system because they're extraordinarily intelligent and they can sense what's not healthy and, and address it. Um, the, 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 the capacity of microbiology is, is what's going to save this world um, if we can figure out how to work with it instead of against it. Um, but basically they feed up to the plant different elements that it needs to build different compounds. So um, the process of taking simple sugars and building them into carbohydrates requires screwing the sugars together and adding a couple extra elements, not just the simple sugars. You know, taking amino acids and building them into proteins re requires that same that same functional process. Um, anybody here ever built a hoop house? A couple of people have built hoop houses. Everybody knows what a hoop house is, pretty much. Yeah. Um, when you start building a hoop house, 
there's a pile of metal pipes that's 10, 12 feet long and, you know, it's, it's like a foot and a half tall and three feet wide. It's not a big pile of pipes. So when you get done building that hoop house, it's 30 feet wide and 100 feet long and 15 feet tall or whatever. Um, and the only thing you've really done to take that pile of pipes and put them together into the structure is basically tighten um, a 9 16 and a half inch nut onto the appropriate bolts over and over again. The whole structure is basically, um, you know, it's it's just a really simple mechanical process tying these pieces together and all of a sudden you've got a whole structure that wasn't there before. Um, and I like to, you know, use the example of the 9 16 and, and the half inch as a metaphor for what an enzyme is in a biochemical reaction. Um, we've heard about enzymes, we've heard about, um, you know, so basically you've got these sugars and to screw the sugars together to build a carbohydrate requires an enzyme that's got a certain size and shape. Um, and every enzyme has a different size and shape based on the element at its core because different elements have different sizes and shape. Copper is one and a half inches across. That's how big copper is and it's got a bonding geometry that's six sided or eight sided or whatever. You know, zinc is 1.7 angstroms across, and it's got a 12-sided bonding geometry. So think about, you know, basic tinker toys or, you know, things you play with as a kid, little magnetic, you know, things with different geometries. That's basically what biochemistry is on some basic level. Enzymes, copper-based enzymes have a certain geometry. Zinc-based enzymes have a certain geometry, and they're used to put things together and take things apart. Um, so when your amino acids are being screwed together to build, a, to build a, a protein, the same enzyme is being used over and over again to put it together or whatever. When that... You know, when you eat that burger, the same enzyme is used to unscrew the protein into its component amino acids so you can use it, just like that socket or wrench. Um, and so um, these elements are critical for, for life to function. And this is a piece, this is the minerals piece that I think um, is where I started out my quest, you know, from broadening organic, my organic perspective. No, I didn't, hadn't heard much about this stuff. Um, but basically... The compounds that we um, have evolved to like, um, the things that, you know, flavor and aroma, the things that our, our, our you know, genetics have evolved us to search for um, are very complicated compounds. They're very, they're very complex. They're very sophisticated. They're very large compounds. They require lots of different sockets and wrenches and screwdrivers and Allen wrenches and all kinds of other things to put together. Um, and... Um, Apparently, 30% of our DNA is associated with the function of our nose and our tongue. 30% of our DNA is, you know, involved in your ability to taste and smell. Um, our, you know, life thinks it's really important that we can discern what to eat and what not to eat. Um, animals, you know, goats have this goat instinct, and they can go out and figure out what's best for them, right? It's not that we don't have it. It's just that we don't develop it or we don't attend to it or focus on it. But I think this is actually central to all the solutions is just saying, you know, how good does your food taste? How that, that has an amazing amount to do with how good it is for you and functionally how good it was to be grown. Right? Organic carrots. Anybody had organic carrots in the grocery store in the wintertime? No. You know that repugnant experience? <laughs> right? Those are basically conventionally farmed using organic ingredients and our bodies telling us that they're not good for us. I don't care if it's local, if it doesn't taste good, right? It, it, what, I, it, what matters is actually the quality of the crop. So to build these compounds, to build these secondary metabolites, these antioxidants, they're called terpenoids and, and you know, alkaloids, and there's lycopene, and there's all these fancy naming, you know, named compounds. To build those things, those they're called plant secondary metabolites. First, you have to build essential oils. And before you build the essential oils, first you have to build the, sorry, the proteins. And before you build proteins, you have to build the carbohydrates. And, you, and, the, and the basic building block here is sugar. This is very simplified, but effectively true, as I understand it. Um, different pathogens, um, Phytophthora, Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Alternaria, Fusarium, etc., um, they have a very simple digestive system and they cannot digest complete carbohydrates. So when your plant is building itself out of complete carbohydrates, it can't be digested anymore. Um, and, this, and this is how it goes. And if, if there was a bale of hay sitting here somewhere in this tent, someone might have considered sitting on it, but no one would have considered eating it. Um, if a cow walked in, or a goat, I use a cow as an example, because it's more easy. Um, the cow would have seen that as food, not as a seat. We all know this, and we all know that the, that's because the cow can digest hay, and we can't. 
because she's got a more sophisticated digestive system than we do. She can digest these more complicated compounds than we can't. Um, we understand that concept, understand that the larval form of a Colorado potato beetle has a much less sophisticated digestive system than you do. It does not have a liver. It, apparently, all the larval forms of insects don't have the enzymes in their guts to digest protein. So as soon as your plant begins to build proteins out of carbohydrates on the way to building oils, on the way to building these things would make it taste and, and smell good, it becomes indigestible to the larvae, larval forms of insects. Um, we start with the soil-borne pathogens, you know, can't digest carbohydrates, then the larvae, then we talk about the blights and mildews can't digest the oils, and then finally the beetles can't digest the plant secondary metabolites. So um, from my perspective, you know, I'm a little bit arrogant and dogmatic about a few things, maybe more than a few things, but um, I don't kill insects and I don't kill diseases on my farm. I don't believe in that. I believe that those are nature's report card telling me, you're actually a C student this year, Dan. Um, you are growing food for insects. This is not food for animals, and therefore, I am taking it out. And if I try to take out nature's report card and produce a crop that's inferior, I am not serving my children who are eating that crop or my customers who are eating that crop, right? I like to think of pests and diseases as nature's report card. and. Um, so hold myself they're, to they're standard. Just depending on simple sugars rather than carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates. The slow-born pathogens, right. as, a, as a general, this is all very general, but all you know, basically we can find the literature and the citations to prove this in the enzyme systems and the biochemistry. It's really quite exciting because you can figure out that your plant is going to be susceptible to this pathogen because it's missing this element, and maybe this microbe which can you know solubilize this element, and you can apply that element and that and that um, microbe. To a field and make it pest resistant. You can you can you can increase the health of the plant by identifying what's not present. We have these correlations figured out, right? We understand this stuff. It's this a role for science. Um, and, you know, we can if we use it humbly to understand how life is designed. Um, we can really, I think, outcompete conventional ag. Um, so I suggest the fact that I've been adding compost to my soil for 35 years. Yeah. explains why I don't have any tomato hornworms, and my neighbors all do. It depends on what's in your compost. Compost, I mean, compost is a compost, right? There's a spectrum of compost, like there's a spectrum of food quality, like there's a spectrum of human health, like there's a spectrum of consciousness. That's a likely explanation, because I've never been able to explain why I have so few bugs on my it's a, property. It's too simplistic, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, functionally it's part of the puzzle. Um, um, you know, a lot of farmers or gardeners use a lot of compost and still have issues with pests and diseases. You know, do your and cucumbers why is that? do your cucumbers die from um, powdery mildew? No. They turn yellow and turn brown, and you know they, they go all the way through till frost. We kill by the frost. You're in a, there's a small number of people who are <laughs> at that level. Um, I got to that level last year with my summer squash, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> right. So first what do planting through till October, <laughs> still picking. Right, so... But you don't compost, you don't do compost... Well, I figure the composting happens in... Right, so when you don't pull the tomato plants out, they fall down. Mm -hmm. When I don't take the mulch out, they, it, it, it gets digested, and that's how the forest does it. I grew up on a farm where we worked all the time and made no money, and I was like, this is no fun. So I like to work as little as possible. I mean, Native Americans had it down, 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 right? No beast of burden, no... No, 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 no cultivation... Right. I mean, they had this the whole process down, so we can learn a lot from indigenous cultures all over the planet, I think. And that's one piece I really want to talk about, at least for a second, is the role of intention and consciousness and, you know, reception. I mean, that's really where it comes, what it comes down to, is being sensitive and, and in, being in communication um, with your land, as all of our <laughs> forebears tell us as the nature of things. And our quantum mechanics is telling us as well is the nature of things, right? We have, we're hardwired with antenna systems in the same way that, um, you know, insects are to read the environment. Um, and anybody ever walked into a room and used to be like, Jesus, what the hell happened here? Like felt something was off, right? Which of your five physical senses was used to do that? All of them. None of them, I would suggest, <laughs> right? I mean, my wife says, something's wrong with Sammy. And I'm like, how do you know? She's like, I can feel it in my uterus. So I'm like, well, I don't know about that. But my mother will call me and say, something's wrong with Sammy. And I'm like, you're right again. Right? We, we know that we have the ability to communicate, to discern. Um, we don't develop it. We don't um, acknowledge it, much less respect it and develop it. But I would suggest that people with those faculties are ones you should respect and be very... Um, <laughs> but for the average humble gardener. in the present in the presence of, and you should invite them to your land. 
to help so you talk to your land about what it wants. But for the average gardener, <clears throat> how do you know if you're short on copper digesting microorganisms? Um, the simplest thing to do is, I mean, what I do, which is, you know, for five bucks or ten bucks, you can get an ounce of an inoculant, which has 25 families of bacteria and 15 families of fungi, and that ounce of inoculant is good for 50 pounds of seed, which means, and it's got a life, you know, span of 10,000 years. So, <laughs> for five bucks, I basically ensure a broad spectrum of families are present um, in an environment that may have been treated well recently, but may not have been treated well 50 years ago, but was definitely being rained on by radioactive isotopes in the 60s and you so know. So you inoculate your seeds, not your soil. The seed. Mm -hmm. You want the baby when it's, you know, when it's born to have mm -hmm. good gut flora. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so getting back to minerals. Well, a lot and, of those flora and, would be um, dormant in that inoculant. They are in their seed state. Right. And they will, they will germinate, they will be hatched, they will be born when you have the right moisture and temperature okay. Okay. is when there is when which is appropriate for seeds as well okay. they've evolved the symbiosis mm -hmm. we can say that the biology evolved the, the, the seeds the plants and, and the animals I would suggest but that's a different conversation um, anyway the minerals and the um, your plants dropping in the fall so I, I think that if your you know plants have um, powdery mildew that's usually a symptom of you know boron is, is you know foundational and calcium and silica um, <clears throat> you know, what I suggest is, is taking a soil test and not a soil test from a, you know, university system. I'm sorry for anybody who's <laughs> representing university systems, but um, I like the Albrecht style, which is, um, Albrecht was, you know, uh, he ran the University of Missouri Soil Department for 20 years. He's a legitimate land-grant university researcher, a brilliant story, I don't have time for it here, but there's a few labs around the country that do that. Look at a broader spectrum of, of, of elements. Um, for biochemistry to function, we need a, 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 you know, a suite of elements. Um, generally, your you know conventional land grant you know reports will give you N, P, and K recommendations, um, but we don't talk about copper and zinc and manganese and you know. Um, anybody heard of vitamin B12? Mm -hmm. Vitamin B12. Uh, sometimes people who are vegetarians are told that they don't have enough vitamin B12 in their diet and they become anemic and they need to supplement with B12. B12 uh, is is the you know common name for a compound referred to in science as cyanocobalamin cyanocobalamin, which is basically one atom of cobalt with a few amino acids attached to it. Um, the amino acids are not in short supply, it's the cobalt that's in short supply. Uh, so functionally we can say that we are cobalt dependent. If you don't have enough B12, you become anemic. If you really don't have enough, you become dead. Well, we, are, we, are, we are cobalt dependent organisms. We require a certain amount for certain enzyme systems to function that we need. Um, interestingly, 80% uh, of the um, no, 80% of the species of uh, soil life that have been studied are also B12 dependent. If you don't have sufficient cobalt in your soil, you don't have a broad spectrum of soil life. And this is, you know, the, uh, there's a bunch of different elements that are really, really critical for life to function. Um, not necessarily critical for you to bulk out. You know, you can you can live on an IV drip, but you're probably not going to be flourishing and vital on an IV drip, right? We have a much more sophisticated need for biochemistry. Um, than a lot of what's actually, if you look at if you look at Miracle Grow, look at the ingredients in Miracle Grow. There's like 15 or 16 different elements in Miracle Grow, right? I mean, they have figured this thing out, right? The most productive tomato plant on history was, I think, it had 600 pounds of cherry tomatoes. It was at the Epcot Center. Um, the scientists had figured out how many of these different elements we need at what different levels, and they had a really long list. And they, this tomato plant was ridiculous, right? <laughs> I mean, we can under, we can learn a lot from the from the science that's been done also in broaden. So I suggest that you, you can do this, you know, on a global scale. We can remineralize land, um, which is one of the you know pretty big limiting factors um, in a lot of areas where soil is worn out, where you know agriculture and civilization have turned what was you know a land of milk and honey into desert. Um, we can remineralize land systemically with literally rock dust and seawater. What the planet planet is made out of, we have present in you know, quadrillions of tons of the critical raw materials we need spread on the land at two tons per acre here and five tons per acre there. We could remineralize India for the you know US military budget in Afghanistan of a month. Right? You want to talk about regreening the planet, revitalizing the planet, mineral deficiencies are, are, are categorical. You don't have enough boron, you're out of luck. Right? You, some of these elements are critical uh, for life to function and when they're not present in, in many places the soils are very weathered. So where where can we get boron? Uh, borax, soap, uh, 30 pounds per acre, be great, you know, 
a great dose to apply. Um, uh, the only Translate problem that into a garden of 100 by 100 garden. How you figure out the square feet. You're totally intelligent. <laughs> Forty thousand square feet in an acre. Thirty pounds per acre. That's three quarters of a pound per thousand square feet. I'm guessing something like that. Um, you said rock dust and seaweed? Seawater. Oh, water. Seawater has 92 different elements in it, which is all of the naturally occurring elements, uh, many of which are, are critical. The lanthanide group, I mean, really, really interesting stuff happens when, when the, look this stuff up. Don't take my word for anything. Just look it up. Um, uh, but rock dust, you know, has all the elements. The basalts and the granites have all the elements. Um, they're more slow release. They're not soluble. They need to be digested, so that's a great thing to be putting into your compost pile if you've got a compost pile. Um, you know, take a soil test, identify which things you don't have at what levels, and put together a program for addressing it. This is basically how our organization has built, has been going around the country instead of walking people through, it's October, what do you do and why? It's November, what do you do and why? It's December, what do you do and why? And let's sort of walk through the growing season, you know, cover crops, inoculation, seed quality, starting, you know, early childhood development, mineral balancing. You know, there's all kinds of things you can you can do to establish a good, you know, environment, and then I suggest get out of the way. If you're doing a good job establishing the environment, the plants will flourish, right? That's what we want. We don't want to be, you know, constantly attending to weak, sickly, you know, animals. You want to be you want to be having vital vital plants that are flourishing, and that's um, that's the basic a basic agenda. I think I touched on. I didn't talk about water. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. Half an hour. Almost at 15? All right. Like, how much almost at 15? 25 minutes. 25 minutes? Okay. That's good. Sure. All right. I'd like to have time for questions at a significant amount. Go for it. Oh, I just want to do anything with azomite. Uh, azomite is a broad spectrum rock dust. Um, generally, it's, you know, a buck a pound or something. Um, and if you go to a local quarry uh, where they've got this stuff called, you know, um, float or fines, um, how many roads around here are not paved? Most. Most. Um, what do they use to build a road out of? Gravel. I don't. I what's that? Aggregate. Aggregate. It's yeah. crushed rock of various sorts, right? Where does it come from? Quarries. Quarries. Where are the quarries? Local sometimes. Where's Lebanon? Almost always local, mm -hmm. right? Five, ten mile radius. You're, you're bound to find a hole in the ground somewhere that's being used by the DPW. To, to you know build roads with so there's a byproduct of that aggregate industry when they take the rock and they crush it they sort out the three quarter inch stone and the quarter inch stone with these little screens and there's a, a go into, into there's a float pond there's a bo there's a byproduct called float or crusher dust um, which is basically um, there's hundreds of millions of tons available in your local you know quarries at two bucks a ton five dollars five bucks a ton what's that CR2 crusher one? Crusher, crusher dust. Yeah. So depending on the you know nature of the rock that they're quarrying, it'll have different elements in it. Yeah. There's a bunch of nice stuff around here, and so you know, if you identify what's not present in your soil, and what's present in this rock dust and what's present in that rock dust, then you can do the math and say, okay, two tons per acre from this hole at five bucks a ton, and three tons per acre from that hole at three dollars a ton is what I need to systemically remineralize my land. And I suggest 75 pounds of sea salt per acre per year as a general prophylactic. Sea salt. Sea salt. salt. 75 pounds. How much salt do you put in the soup? Anybody? Just enough? A little bit more than none? <laughs> right? Enough for flavor. Right? So basically, you know, it rains a lot in general. Our soils are thin in general. A lot has been weathered, has been worn out in general. And there's a bunch of elements that we don't need much of that's present in sea salt. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, buy a ton of sea salt for 150 bucks, right? I mean, there's... Where? <laughs> Find it. <clears throat> Almost every single one of your questions can be answered if people go to our website. Um, we are a nonprofit educational organization. Um, we, you know, give these courses, which have been recorded and are available for free. You can download them. And they're not the most newish, new, new versions, but a lot of it's there. Um, we have a massive bibliography. Um, we have a links to uh, other you know, people around the country. We have mineral depots where people can coordinate, collectively buy, source a lot of stuff that's otherwise not available. We've got local chapters where people can get together once a month and say, okay, now how the hell do I read my soil test? And, you know, where are you getting your inoculants from? And um, how about potting soil? Can we work on potting soil together? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Good. these practical questions of how-to is what we've been attempting to 
establish solutions for, understanding that it's not the lack of intention that's the issue, it's the lack of follow through. And in many cases, the lack of access to resources and knowledge. And so if we can, from the, from the grassroots, build up the solutions and say, look, don't take anybody's word for it, but when you see a six foot tall you know, eggplant busting out with fruit, people are gonna say, what are you up to? So if it's true, it'll work, and if it works, it'll spread. That's the basic idea. Um, so anyway, there's I mean, I, lots and lots and lots to cover. I think I've touched on some of the key pieces. Um, hydration, of course, is, is foundational. Um, ideally, um, we've got a, de a decent water table, and you don't have a plow pan, and the tidal force will be moving the water up and down um, in the subsoil twice a day to water your plants. In many cases, you don't have a decent water table because it's been a drought, or you do have a plow pan, and so the that doesn't happen. Um, you know, permaculture theory says that you want to be taking care of the water on your land as a high, high priority, establishing water ponds, etc., on the you know as high as possible. Depending on whether you live in a city or a suburbs, or you, whether you can control your water or not, um, irrigation systems. You know, maintaining hydration is foundational. I like to say, if you can't maintain hydration, don't waste your money on minerals. Um, soil testing and all that kind of stuff is really exciting and like kind of certain people they could geek out about it, but. Um, if you can't maintain hydration, if there's not enough water in your soil for your soil life to stay alive, then it doesn't really matter whether they have the minerals necessary for them to, you know, be healthy. And you can discern without you know, have enough water by sticking your hand in your soil and feeling it. Um, I suggest that the entire soil profile, the whole garden, everywhere should be moist, not just this little strip underneath the plants. Um, you want those roots to be at least as big as the top of the plant, if not bigger. They should all be reaching out and talking to each other. If you've got dry areas in between your beds, that's basically the plant roots are being held back from flourishing. Life is not flourishing. So the field is a field. It's an energy field. It's a, it's, it, you, you really want to be keeping it alive and vital um, and vibrating um, uh, consistently, constantly. Any, does it get dry up here in April sometimes? Get dry after the snow melts? No, we don't have that dry. It just wind blows and the, and the, and the, like the fire season sometimes, right? Before you plant your garden, oftentimes, the soil is really dry. If the soil is really dry, that means there's no life. If there's no life, that means when you put your plants in, they don't have any food to eat. If they don't have any food to eat, that means they're susceptible to insects. Anybody ever had flea beetles in end of April? Nobody? Has flea beetles in end of April? Yeah, right? So, um... We can see, you know, how this all interrelates, but think about it as a living ecosystem under there, and it needs to be fed, and it needs to have water, and needs to have air, it needs all these things consistently, constantly. It's only by, you know, establishing high levels of life at the bottom of the food chain that we should expect life to flourish higher up in the food chain. Um, so, uh, I just want to talk a, a touch about human health, and then have time for questions. I think I still have a few minutes left for questions. Um, um, I talked about enzyme systems, you know, uh, roughly, and minerals and things like that. Um, there's this uh, project called the Human Genome Project that was performed in the late 90s. I'm sure many of you remember, remember hearing about it or have heard about it. The uh, Human, Human Genome Project was a you know, process of mapping the human DNA, identifying all the different pieces of the human DNA. And in the process of mapping the human DNA, they also mapped all the enzymes necessary to replicate human DNA because it's a big compound. has to get screwed together with different sockets and wrenches, like I was saying. Um, and in the process of identifying all the enzymes, they were able to identify all the elements at the center of those enzymes. And so we have a list of all the different elements that are necessary to replicate one strand of human DNA. It is dozens of elements. If you're worrying about nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, you've got three. Or calcium, that's four. There are dozens of elements necessary to replicate every strand of human DNA. Um, as I understand it, um, you get four billion cells every day. Four billion brand new cells every day. Every day, Four billion of your oldest, junkiest cells are disassembled, you know, spare parts are saved, the rest is, you know, down the tubes, and four billion new cells are built. Your eyeballs, your gonads, your liver, your flesh, everything is constantly being rebuilt. Um, you know, your flesh, your, so your, 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 your blood may take two weeks to go through an entire cycle of, of, of replication, and your bones might take seven years, but if you average out how many cells you've got and how many and how many um, new you get every day, you get a new body every six months, plus or minus. So you live to be 100 years old, you've gone through 200 bodies. Not exactly, of course, because the bones take longer and the blood goes faster, but roughly, you get 200 bodies. And what your body is built out of is what is put into it. Um, if you don't have inside of every one of those cells, inside of every one of those cells is a nucleus, we all know that. 
inside of the, every one of those nuclei is the, is the DNA. If you are missing one of the elements when that DNA is being replicated, then you don't have the enzyme. I'm speaking fast, but I think everybody's following me here. Um, you don't have the enzyme, but that piece of the DNA does not get put together properly, right? Missing the 916s, what do you do? All the 916s nuts don't get tightened down. Or they have to use the vice grips or whatever. What's that? Or you go metric. Or you go metric. 13 mil might work. Right, yeah, exactly. There's secondary and tertiary enzyme pathways for this exact circumstance. And what's been going on is that because we are so critically deficient in these elements, physiologically, for the past three generations of what we now call conventional lag, that some of those pieces are not being put together properly. And that's called a, a marker, a break in the DNA. So we can find correlations, for example, between chromium deficiency and the genetic markers for diabetes. Mm -hmm. All right, this is you know, a fairly well-known one. Um, what happens when you have chromium added back into your diet because you've been eating well, next time that cell replicates itself? You've got the 916 ths that piece can get screwed together. All of a sudden, that genetic marker's not there any for, anymore. Um, there's this guy, Hippocrates, who some people may have heard of. The Hippocratic Oath is sworn by you know most doctors when they graduate their like 25 years of school or whatever it is, how, how many years of school you have to go through to be a doctor from all the way up. Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, which means no slicing, cutting, burning, etc., etc. Then let food be thy medicine. Let food be thy medicine. Um, uh, Linus Pauling, I think he got a couple Nobel Prizes. Um, at the root of every degenerative disease is a mineral deficiency. At the root of every degenerative disease is a mineral deficiency. Um, uh, I suggest uh, it's, you know, the epidemic level of degenerative diseases is a wonderful incentive for us to get our heads on straight about this. And, um, you know, few things inspire people more than the well-being of their children. And as we're getting these degenerative diseases to become more and more prevalent in children, which is the last stage before you know, nature takes us out, right? I mean, she's got a system like, you're not flourishing, you're out of here, right? I mean, we can look at a lot of the things that are going on, and that's just, she's got her rules, and when you play by the rules, you're fine, and when you violate the rules, that's it. I mean, as we degenerate, as we get sicker and dire and have and die more, more, more we're young, um, you know, we can, we, I think we can correlate a lot of this stuff. So what's exciting here is that if we can actually increase the nutrition in food, we can systemically address these these issues of human health, which actually is a national security issue because of the amount of money that's being put in by the federal budget to deal with health care, right? We're not solving this issue. Um, uh, a corollary of this process of carbon dioxide and water and sunlight being converted into oxygen and sugar, and the sugar being put into the soil, is that you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into the soil. Uh, anybody who's heard about this global warming thing knows we've got 120 parts per million more carbon in the atmosphere now than were present in 1750. Uh, my understanding is that if all of the world's agricultural land was sequestering a half a percent of organic matter per year out of the atmosphere, which has been done on 5,000 acre farms in North Dakota and 20,000 acre farms in, Aust in Australia, right? they're not mulching. They're not composting. They're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis and putting it in the soil increasing organic matter levels by half a percent per year. If you did that on the world's agricultural lands, it would take three and a half years to sequester all the carbon that's been put into the atmosphere since 1750. Three and a half years to take everything out of the atmosphere that's been put in there in the last 250 years back into the soil, right? We have the solution, which is plants growing well, growing naturally, can solve these problems systemically. Of course, there's a bunch of carbon in the ocean, um, that needs to go back into the atmosphere and then back onto the land. And of course, we're not going to transform all agricultural lands this year. But as far as I'm concerned, from a systemic standpoint, we have the capacity to do this. And it correlates with self-interest. It correlates with the health of your children. Right? It says, this is, we have to talk realistically about, uh, about solving problems and not sort of have fantasy ideas, but we have to actually have practical grassroots, like how can we bust this thing out strategy. So we can talk about agribusiness and the fact that when you put down chemicals, then you don't have any soil life, which is when you need the um, pesticides and the fungicides because the plants aren't healthy. And we can talk about, you know, if farmers were growing healthy plants and they wouldn't A, be using fertilizer and they wouldn't B, be using sides, which means that all the money that goes to agribusiness wouldn't be going to agribusiness, which means that they wouldn't be able to write the farm bill anymore, which means that we could actually have a, sh a you know, chance at an at a intelligent food policy. I mean, I think we can, through growing healthy plants, through focusing on nutrition, flavor, aroma, those really rudimentary instinctual and, and personal 
um, choices, we can solve a lot of uh, deeper systemic issues. Um, so I'll just you know, culminate here with, with one point, and that is that part of what we're trying to do organizationally is develop the capacity for uh, consumers to actually test quality, to be able to go to the farmer's market, to be able to go to the grocery store, and to go burp, burp, crap, burp, crap, burp, decent, and choose the most flavorful bag of carrots off the shelf. Um, um, it's, it's, basic, it's basic physics, actually. You know, in chemistry, every element has a certain size, a certain number of protons and electrons. In physics, every element has a vibration um, that vibrates at a certain frequency, you know, 580 nanometers or whatever. We know what Alpha Centauri is made out of. Alpha Centauri is a star. It's four or five light years away or something. Not because we've been there, but because we've read the light off of there, and we can read it's 52% you know, um, hydrogen and 47% helium and 1% other the gases. We can read that off of the light. So a tool that can flash a light and read the light coming off of an eggplant can read what the eggplant is made up of, and we can discern relatively how nutritious it is. So um, it's perverse that we have to go the tech route to getting people to eat food that tastes good. But if that's where today's day and age is, so be it. Um, my experience in talking to you know, fairly significant companies like Whole Foods is um, no way we're going to help you with this, but uh, when you're two years out from having it, please come tell us because we will tell all of our growers they have two years to meet standard. That if we give the consumer the ability to discern That'll put the fear of the Lord into the supply chain, the, the system, and we actually have a direct economic incentive for business, agribusiness, the whole, everybody, to do the right thing, uh, which is what we need. We need visceral economic drivers as far as I'm concerned. All the good ideas in the world don't come to pot if you don't have power, and money is power, and most people buy food. So let's use that money. Let's focus, to, focus on eating the best food and uh, growing the best food. Uh, I think we really can do a lot, a lot if we if we just do that. So, um, I think I've left a few minutes for questions. I've got other topics that I don't have time to get into unless you ask me the right things. Uh, yes. This is a right? Uh, that over there is a refractometer, refractometer which is the best tool we've got right now. So, doesn't it just measure carbs? Um, the refractometer measures the refraction of light, and um, if you stick your hand in the in a bathtub, you'll see that it apparently bends. That's the full of water, obviously. If you stick your hand in the ocean, it bends a different degree because the dissolved salts in the ocean water make the light bend more. So there's no carbohydrates in seawater, and yet the light is bending. So a refractometer measures the bend of light. The common misconception is it's measuring sugar. It's measuring dissolved solids, and many of the dissolved solids in a crop may be sugars, but that is not what it's measuring. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's calibrated to percent sucrose, which is a different conversation. Can I just went through a chemical intensive, and that's yeah. exactly what they said. That I, people who know better, I mean, some people don't know, know the answer, but people who do know the answer still say this, which is a minor pet peeve of mine, or so whatever, it's a medium-sized pet peeve of mine. It's measuring total dissolved solids. It's measuring, which is, and there's a bunch of other amino acids and, and, and other compounds that are in there. Um, and it's a very simplistic tool. It's, there's no battery. You can use it 10,000 times, and... Until you drop it on the cement, you can keep using it, so it's a great tool, but you have to take a piece of the carrot and squish it to get a drop of juice out of it to get the reading, which is not going to be appropriate for going to the grocery store. And it's a simplistic number. It's not a you know sophisticated biochemical breakdown. Um, what we're looking for, this whole bionutrient conversation, is to say, can we figure out what the levels and ratios are of elements that correlate to amino acids and protein profiles and secondary metabolites, and can we say relatively... On a scale of what we've discerned through a, a large data set, this carrot's an 85, this carrot's a 73, and this carrot's a 96. We should be able to do that. So there's no, like, you have arrived or, you're, or you don't belong. It's not like a yes or no. It's a continuum, like most of life is, right? Life is a continuum. There's not like a certification standard where you are now alive or you are not alive. You are now organic or you're not organic. You are Demeter certified. You are not Demeter certified. You are within a 100-mile radius. You are not within a 100-mile radius. What matters, I think to a large degree is that flavor. And guess what? When you pick things not ripe from a long ways away because they have to get shipped raw because you can't do it otherwise, they don't taste as good, right? When you don't have a well-functioning biological ecosystem, they don't taste as good. So anyway, sorry, a little rant on refract confidence. But that's the best tool we've got right now. And if you're being intellectually honest, it's a great tool you can use to go into the, onto the garden and you can squish the leaf and you can see how healthy the plant is in real time. It's a good way to a lot of us think we're pretty good growers, and when we get the refractometer out, we say, muscle must be broken. 
Um, um, so anybody who needs a little bit of humbling, um, take a reflectometer to their garden and walk around with them, <laughs> or threaten to. Um, yeah, the leaf, the leaf should be 12 when you squish it, as a general standard. And um, um, some crops it's easier to achieve than others. Uh, you'll find many crops are like 3, 4, or 5. Um, so use it as a benchmark. I'm at, I'm at 4 this year. Let me see if I can get to 6 next year. Right? It's a process. It's a process. Other questions? Yes. Uh, do you have any thoughts on diet? Can you eat meat to be healthy? <coughs> on a human diet? Yeah. Um, um, I have my personal thoughts, Ooh. but um, more broadly, uh, I think what leaves you feeling vital and um, clear and energized, and um, you know, we have different bodies and we have different, um, you know, genetic histories. Um, Depends on what your objective, objectives are. If you're a you know a renunciant living in the mountains and your objective is super consciousness and you don't want the frequencies of animal in your body, then perhaps you've got a different set of agendas than if you're doing physical labor every day. Um, you know where you're at in your life, what's your level of consciousness? I think we're all individuals. Um, I mean, I'm you know I think the more alive, the more simple, the more natural, um, the better in general. How does it make you feel? How you know what's your level of vitality and energy? We are hardwired with an extraordinarily sophisticated, you know, tool, right? It's called the physical body. It's, it functions on multiple octaves. Um, you know, we talk about the physical plane. We don't talk about the other octaves of reality. Um, you know, to really get down to the point, for me, the whole point, the objective of getting good food into people's bodies is to get them to be vibrating more coherently so they can be attuned to the overtones of consciousness. As far as I'm concerned, we're all dissonant. We're vibrating dissonantly. Anybody been to an elementary school band, band concert? Elementary school band concert? Oh, yeah. Anyone? <laughs> you know the archetype of which I refer, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> right? You are vibrating dissonantly when you're not in tune. When your biochemistry, when your when your DNA is not coherent, when it's broken, it vibrates dissonantly. Your vibe is out of tune when you're biochemically not built right. Each element has a vibration. Each compound has a vibration. What are the levels of, what are the levels and ratios of those vibrations in our bodies? Um, that, so if you've been to an elementary school band concert, if you've been to an acapella choir, a beautiful, exquisite acapella choir that was singing so, so in tune that there's overtones were heard, right? Have you heard of overtones? You know that when there's four voices singing and the fifth note is sounded? Um, harmonics, they're called. Right? I would suggest that you know the 96% of reality that we refer to in science as dark matter and dark energy is just different octaves of reality. There are more subtle, subtle vibrations, like the piano keyboard. You've got this octave and this octave and this octave and this octave. And when the physical plane octave is vibrating coherently, then we can tune into the higher octaves of consciousness. And only then are we really able to attune to our true purpose and path and guidance and make the right decisions and have a political, you know, a, a coherent political conversation, right? We're making appropriate... <laughs> what was that? A, about the politics? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> a little raspberry from nature? <laughs> yeah. I would suggest that, you know, actually, through eating food that tastes good, we tune ourselves to our higher nature. And so that's really, you know... You know, that's that's the internal process, which they say requires many, many, many incarnations. So, um, you know, depending on your philosophy or your understanding of things. Um, yeah. Five minutes. Um, if you want to see more of this one-man show, <laughs> there's a course sometime happening this fall. What is it? two-day course, you walk into the growing season, day one is fall and winter, day two is spring and summer, it's 200 bucks, it's the primary um, action of our organization, um, and we do this all over the country, so um, there's an introductory lecture scheduled, it's all on our website, I'm sure, and, yeah, cool, and remind us what your website was again, uh, bionutrients.org, I'll write this one in brown too, Bionutrient.org. 
And if you are looking for, you know, an experience where people on this wavelength from university research to, um, you know, uh, seed savers to consumers and nutritionists are all getting together our annual conferences in December. Um, and the flyer for that is back there as well. Um, but, yeah, I think, I guess that's it. Uh, I'll hang out for a little bit.